Hey, so this is part one of what's going to be a three part tutorial on how I did the mold for my new skull shot glass set. Um, part one is going to be on the seams, which is the most tedious part, but it's also kind of the most important part. Um, part two will be on how I put the details in and then part three will be on assembling the entire mold. Uh, I'm not going to get into how I set up files to print at real world scale. I already did a tutorial on that that is on my YouTube channel. There's also tutorials on um, some parts of this that are covered there. Um, I will still talk about them, but I might go into a little more detail in the older tutorial. So it's worth checking out. And I'm going to talk a little bit about UV unwrapping, um, but I'm not going to get into it like if you really needed to UV unwrap something for uh, texturing. There are better tutorials out there on that. And then this model and um, my previous Moai mug are both fairly low resolution models that have subdivision surface modifiers on them. Uh, I'm also not going to get super into that because there are far better tutorials out there on that. But just to, to be aware that um, that is part of my workflow, especially early on. I like to block out in very low resolution models like this with a subdivision surface modifier on them to smooth them out. Um, I can go ahead and shut off that modifier so you can see that's a blocky, that's a blocky model right there. Um, I find this easier to work with when there are fewer polygons. There's less than 400 polygons here. And with something like proportional editing turned on, you can, um, you know, kind of change and distort any model that you might be starting with. And then I put on some, uh, some of these pink edges or edge creases, which again, I would go find a tutorial on how subdivision surfaces work if that's not something you're familiar with. Someone else is going to cover it better than I am. Andrew Price is always a good resource for that. But um, yeah, this is a skull model that was part of a skeleton that I bought. And I would definitely say if you're thinking about doing something um, and you need some models as part of your design, someone has probably already done it. Don't model a skull again from scratch. It's a waste of your time. Just go get one. If you can think of something, somebody has probably done it, and you can go give yourself a head start by spending five bucks like I think this mesh was, and then putting your own stamp on it, putting your own style on it. You can take, uh, this was a much more naturalistic looking skull when I started, and I added some um, exaggeration and some uh, creases and some distortion to get it into something that I, I thought looked fun. So yeah, give yourself a head start. Go ahead and, and buy a mesh. Um, my Moai mesh, I actually built from scratch, but it was also very low resolution subdivision model like this to make it easier to work with. Um, so it's, it, it just does, it speeds things up, especially early on when you're just trying to figure out the basics of where your molds, uh, sides are going to be. Um, you can make a mold that has any number of sides that you want. I have some five or six sided molds going right now. Um, I would highly recommend, especially if you're doing this for ceramics and casting tiki mugs to stick to a five piece mold that is a mold with four sides and one base piece, because you can actually get a lot done within five pieces. Um, I had been working on my Skull Crusher, which is my snake mug for a long time, and I was so frustrated with it. And it was only when I decided, you know what, this is just gonna be a five piece mold that it actually got done uh, and is in the printer now and is gonna be out um, sometime around Christmas. At least I'll have some samples. So, um, the subdivision and then gradually increasing your resolution as you figure out where your mold seams are going to be uh, is a good approach. So these red lines are the UV seams, and this is usually used for um, texturing if you are, um, let's go back, we're going to edit that a little bit. So these red lines are, yeah. So these red lines are the UV seams, and that is usually used uh, if you were making a video game asset and you wanted to put some sort of two-dimensional image texture or hand-painted texture or whatever onto this. You kind of need to divide it up into what they call islands and flatten it out. 
Um, and I'll show you what that looks like real quick. This is um, all of those pieces sort of flattened out so that you can apply your texture to them. But I figured out that they would be useful for marking mold seams. So what I do is I take a fairly low resolution subdivision mesh like this, and I go in and um, mark the mold seams from each view. So to make sure that you don't have undercuts, what you wanna do is turn off your perspective view so that you have uh, an orthographic view, which is what they call a view that has no perspective, whenever you're in your front, side, top, bottom views. Um, if you go to File, or actually, sorry, if you go to Preferences, and then Navigation, and make sure that Auto Perspective is checked, whenever you go into a front, or a side, or a top view, I'm pressing all the wrong buttons, we're going to edit that. <coughs> so to turn that on, go to Edit, Preferences, go to Navigation, and then make sure that Auto Perspective is checked. So what that will do is whenever you go into your front, your side, your top, your bottom views, it will turn off the perspective. And that makes it a lot easier to make sure that you don't have undercuts. So if you look at this, um, we're going to take this side here, which is the left side of the mug. And if we follow these red UV seams all the way around, we can see all of the vertices, which means that if that was a mold piece, it would come straight off and there would be no undercuts. We wouldn't have any problems. If we go to the front here, same thing. Now this is going to change a little bit when we apply some more resolution to it and we're going to have to adjust. But all of these pieces as they were right now would pull straight off with no undercuts because we can see, if we trace this red line all the way around, we can see all of the vertices. So now that I have the basic mold pieces marked out, and again, that's the front, one side, the other side, the top, back, bottom. Those are all marked out. I can increase the resolution on this model by applying the subdivision surface modifier. So we're gonna go into face mode real quick here. And one great thing is that once all of these UV islands are marked off, that is you have a red boundary that goes around an area, if you hover over it and press L, it will select everything within that boundary. And that is really handy for selecting things when you're working with models at any resolution. But as you're gonna see in a second here, when we increase the resolution, we're gonna apply this subdivision modifier. All of those mold boundaries are still there, even though it added all this additional geometry. So now what we can do is we can go in and we can start adjusting some of these seams if there is an undercut or if there is a kind of a weird uh, zigzag shape like this that we maybe want to be smoother. So there's two ways that you can do that. Um, now that we have the orthographic view turned on, we can, with this high resolution model, go check these edges again. And like I was saying at the beginning, that's why this is kind of tedious, but you kind of have to go through it. We'll follow this edge all the way around and we can see everything from this perspective, so there will be no undercuts. So we're gonna look at the front, and again, we can check that. And you have some areas where it looks pretty close, but those will still work. That will still work. And that will still work right there. And let's see, we're gonna follow this jaw, and now you see here, we lose that red line. So if we go into X-ray view, you can see that we have some points that are a little bit behind where we can see them. So let's grab this point and see that's a little hidden, see? And that might be a problem. So there's two ways to fix this. In this case, it's not gonna change the shape a whole lot if I just move that over to where I can see it. So from this bottom view, we're gonna hit G and X to move it along the X axis and then I'm just gonna pull it out a tiny bit so that I can see it. And we'll do that a couple times. And if you hold down shift, it kind of, uh, it moves a little slower, it constrains your movement, so you get subtler 
movements um, in any field. If that's moving things around, if that's numbers, it will, instead of um, doing this, it moves more slowly. And it can give you a little more precise control. Let's go with the next one up. G, X, pull it out until we can see it. And that one we can see, that one we can see. So now this line will not be undercuts. And it doesn't alter the shape very much because those were very subtle moves. So that's one solution. Another solution, if you have a, a, a shape like this that we maybe would like to be a little bit smoother, we can just cut a new line that we want that seam to follow, uh, either by using the knife tool or by using the join command. So let's show you the knife tool real quick. If you hit K and then click on the vertice C that you want to start on, vertex you want to start on, and you can cut whatever shape you would like that mold piece to be now. And if you hit enter to commit it, and then if you hit control E immediately, because it's all still selected, you can mark your seam, and now you have a new seam. What I like to do actually, I'm gonna undo that, is actually just select the first in the last vertex and hit J and it will just automatically draw a line between those two things. And that usually gives a nice and pretty smooth line. And you could do that from, from anywhere. We could go up here and hit J and it will draw us a new mold seam. And control E, mark that seam. Now we need to get rid of this old seam. So we're gonna go here and I'm using control to pick the shortest path. So it will just connect in between the areas that I clicked and, and pick the shortest distance to get from one vertex to the next. And then we can hit control E again and clear seam. And now if we use our little selection trick, gonna be in face mode for that, you can see that it has moved that seam to a different location that we like a little bit better. Now, since we've made some changes, but we only made them on one side here, I'm gonna add a mirror modifier and click bisect. So you want x-axis and then bisect on the x-axis. And then if we apply that, it's going to change uh, the mesh and copy that to both sides. So the moves that we made down here, even though it's hard to see, those have been copied, and then this is a little easier to see. That seam has now been moved over. So you can move any seams that you want that way, either by moving the vertices around just a little bit to make sure that you can see them from one of your camera views that would correspond to the direction that your mold piece is pulling out in, um, or you can just cut new seams wherever you want them to be. Now, to have nicer geometry to work with, which is useful later on, I usually remesh this and cut the seams a few different times. In this case, I think we only need to do it this one time, but I have all these little, you know, weird triangular pieces and small pieces that I don't necessarily want. So this is where I use an add-on called Quad Remesher. It will remesh your geometry. Um, it does a better job than the built-in Quadraflow remesher that Blender has. Let me show you how that responds quickly. So if we go into um, the remesh tab here and hit quad for Quadraflow remesh, and then let's say um, 20,000, let's go 20,000 faces here and hit okay. It's, but that's not great. It doesn't really follow the edges you can see. Uh, doesn't follow the edges of the nose or the jaw or any of those nice edge loops that we had. So the quad remesher add-on, um, I think it's about $100. I did another video on it. I think it's incredibly, incredibly useful. But in this case, what I do is I assign different materials to each of our five, six sides, um, and it will remesh based on those boundaries. So 
let's pick this side piece here. And I made a little add-on that I will attach to this post that just assigns random shaders to an object. So assign random shaders. It makes all of these different materials and assigns them all to the object. And then if we select one side, we can go through and we can change it so that there's a different material on each side. You can use the same colors more than once. You just don't want to have them adjacent to each other. So for example, I've got this pink on the front and the back. Um, because they're not touching, the remesher will treat them as separate pieces. So now that we have our different sides marked like that, we can again say we want to shoot for 20,000 and we want to make sure that we have use materials checked off. And then for this model, we can keep symmetry. Sometimes I use that, sometimes I don't. But the main thing is use materials. And then we will remesh it. And now, if we go in and we look at that, we have perfect edge flow. That uh, topology follows all of the edges that we marked out. And let's say you wanted to get even uh, more fine-tuned with how the remesher decides where to put the edge loops. Let's, uh, you could even mark off the eyes. So let's, um, we'll hit uh, Alt and then click on an edge and that will get you the edge ring. And then we're gonna go to Select, Loops, uh, Loop Inner Region. And now we can assign that a different texture. We'll do the same thing to this side. Select, Loop, Inner Region, and now, if we remesh it again, you will see that it follows that edge perfectly now. So this is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly useful for marking seams. And I usually do this a couple different times um, just to make sure that I have everything with really nice topology and have all of the seams exactly where I want them. So once it has remeshed, um, you can use another trick, which is if we select a face and we hit uh, Shift G and select similar material, and then we go to select loops, boundary loop, it will select the outside edge of that material, which is where our seam line used to be, and we can hit Control E and then mark seam and mark it again. So now that all of the seams are marked, we can hit Shift G again. We can select similar seam. And for this to work, you need to, in object mode, set origin to geometry to make sure that the origin is right in the center of your geometry. So now with all those seams selected, we can hit E to extrude, hit Enter immediately, and then hit Alt S to scale out along normals. And there are our mold walls. In the next part, I'm actually going to go into how to add the details. And then in the third part, we'll get back to these mold walls and I'll show you how to extrude them out, separate each piece, make them solid, and then trim off all the junk that you don't need. Um, so hopefully this was useful. This is, uh, like I said, part one of three. And um, the next part should be up uh, probably this weekend.